Hello and welcome to the Haughty Culturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas. We do post every week, so hit subscribe if you want to follow our continuing adventures and the notification bell. And Stephen, what magical world have you brought us to today? Well, we're in a lovely garden in a little village in the middle of Victoria called Lionville. The garden is called Reverie and it is a remarkable place. I am in a Reverie. It is just extraordinary. So in this video, we're going to take a sort of a, a wide view, I suppose, of some of the more interesting aspects yeah. of it. What are some of the high points for you that we're going to share with the viewers? All right. Well, I think one of the major things from my perspective is the use of sculpture elements in the garden. Yes. Uh, so that's an important part of this particular video, but also the use of spaces and shapes and forms and things within the garden. So it will be a little bit of a mixture of planty things and architecturally things. Planty things? Yes, is that a technical term? Yes. It definitely is. I think what we should do first of all is go and meet John, the very generous owner who has allowed us to wander through and have a chat to him about the sculpture. I think that's a great idea. Let's go and find him. All right. And the giant dog, Ned. <laughs> John, thank you so much and Ned for letting us wander through your garden. It's just extraordinary. Yes, it is. It's, it's unique and I assume is a uh, reflection of the personality of the owner. Partially. <laughs> <laughs> the disorder is an accurate reflection, I think, and the weeds. But one of the things that's really obvious is the extraordinary large scale sculpture that you've got scattered around. You blessed to have enough space. What is your philosophy about oh. sculpture in the garden? Um, it stumble upon it and then find a place for it. So you don't go out looking for something for a spot? Um, no, because I find it's inevitably not successful in doing so. That if I go with something in mind, I can never find it. As I can stumble upon it somewhere, online or in driving around. That's, yep. that's where this, this one came from South Australia, seen before we actually bought this property. And then after we bought it, we thought, oh, well, I thought it'd be great. Rang them, it was still available, and they put it on us and drove it from Adelaide to here. Now, John, you've come from a completely different in gardening environment to a Victorian country town. What are some of the things that you hadn't planned on when you came out here to Lionville? Scale. <laughs> scale. Scale insects or every, the scale of the every, garden? Everything. Not insects, but the climate. Mm. This is really severe, long winters. Yep. Short spring, summer. Mm. Um, six to eight weeks behind Melbourne in flowering time. Yep. Mm. Um, and getting used to not being able to grow things, certain things. I've never had a garden where we really couldn't grow pretty much what we wanted. Yeah. So did you have to change your your whole scheming in terms of the kind of things that you had envisaged and, and work with it? Were you yes. bitterly disappointed at um, points? Um, <laughs> sad if anything because um, things like cream clavias I thought oh no they'll be fine because uh, you know, we've had them in the top of Mount Dandenong and so on um, and they were going to turn into mush and I rescued them mm. um, things that I thought would be okay mm. are simply not mm. and it's for snow is easy but the frosts the bitter winds um, are killers yeah. um, and you know, and you get frost in Melbourne, or used to, mm. once upon a time. No more though, thank goodness. <laughs> no, but you know, here, you know, October frost, tender, because things are late season, yeah. tender maple growth in October, I'm out at five in the morning hosing it off because the frost will kill the maples, as I have seen happen. That is commitment. <laughs> yes, it, it is, is commitment. commitment. It is commitment. Would you be out hosing on a frosty morning, Stephen? Oh, look, if I had to, yes. I've got, an, I've got enough passion for my plants that, yes, I've been known to do such things, but I'm not in quite a severe climate so my maples don't need a good hosing there we are well thank you so much for welcoming us in and letting us wander around your amazing garden we might just go and scope out more sculpture why not indeed there we go pleasure thank Enjoy. you john we will i am and <laughs> ned is too ned <laughs> well one of the extraordinary things about this garden is i don't know there's a place in in lao called the field of jars and it is a neolithic site with these enormous stone pots basically yeah. and they're spread all over the landscape this reminds me of the field of jars in lao what is going on here <laughs> yes this isn't necessarily something i would do a garden should reflect the personality of the owner well we have met john and that is certainly the case yes yes he ha has a great sense of drama and he certainly does his garden with conviction which is important now that's the thing i think I'm still 
on the fence, or should we say on the hedge, yeah. about this. But I think, yes, don't be apologetic. If you're going to do a bold statement, make a bold statement. This is a whole paddock full of giant rocks with poor, contorted, <laughs> twisted... What are they? Meddlers. Meddlers. Yeah, yeah I, I would never have thought to use meddlers no. for something like this. So apparently the meddlers were already here when John bought the place. But they'd and the been, rocks. And the rocks. Uh, but they had been let sort of go wild and certainly weren't being managed. And so he's now pulled, pulled them back into line. And so they've become, I don't know, a blanket for each rock. It's quite beautiful because it does look like an ancient site. It, does. it feels, I don't know, sort of druidy or yeah. Neolithic or Laotian. Yeah, well, I was going to say it reminds me of some of those strangler figs that you see growing over the sides of buildings in some of the uh, tropical Asian areas of the world. Yeah. So, but to use meddlers is an interesting thought. I, I, I mean, in fact, I can't get my head around the thought process. It would have said, we'll install rocks and then we're going to train meddlers over them. It just is beyond me. I don't, I don't get it at all. But but the thing about this plant is, and I'm, I'm sort of starting to warm a little bit, and the reason is, or the reasons are, in fact, yes. you've got these wonderful big stones. Yep. You've got them encased in plant material, which in this case is medlar, mm. and then you have seasonal interest happening. Yep. So in the late spring, you get the large white blossoms of the medlar, and we've got a few leftover ones here. Hanging on, yeah. So you get this sort of white smattering over it. Yes. In the late summer, you've got the fruit, which yes. of course we all know you can make jellies, jams and preserves with. Which are forming. And in fact a liqueur. So, ah. so you can use the fruit if you wish to do so. In the autumn, these stones will then turn to a fire of orange, red and yellow. So the foliage will all turn beautifully. And in the winter, when the plants are bare, there'll be this really interesting sculptural encasement of the rocks with the branches of the medlar. Which looks like, an, you know, one of those ancient myths where someone was turned into stone or a tree. I don't know. Yeah. There's something quite ancient and mythic about it. It's extraordinary. I, I'm still not convinced. But no, I, I'm not either. I think it's an amazing decorative and landscaping choice and it's it is extraordinary yeah well it's certainly it's the only one of its type i've ever seen yeah and i mean in that sense it probably has every right to be there for that very reason because it's different it is you know so many gardens are made in the same mold and it's almost like painting uh, to numbers it's a bit sad it so is. when somebody does something sort of quirky interesting different I may or may not actually engage with it, but I can actually take it on board as what they're doing. Yeah. I always say to people, if you want garden gnomes, make sure you have all seven. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, Stephen, we should go and see something else extraordinary in what? the garden. Why not indeed? <laughs> I love an avenue, Stephen, and I don't think I have ever seen a Copper Beach Avenue. You'd have to do this with some conviction. Yeah. Copper beech by nature is a very dark leafed plant. Yes. So you've got to have a little bit of the goth in you, I think, if you're going to plant a, <laughs> a gothic avenue. <laughs> a gothic avenue. That's not what struck me, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. Now these have been planted quite close together. They are actually at this stage, they're sort of arching over the driveway. You virtually have to drive through them to come up the driveway. The owner has decided that that's the way they're going to stay until such time as you virtually can't get up the driveway. Mm. And eventually it will become this dark, somber canopy. So you'd be coming up the driveway wondering what you were coming to. Very Game of Thronesy. Yes, it is rather. Let's hope there's no deaths at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and look at something else fabulous in the garden. All right, why not? All right, here we are in the body yes. of the garden. Yes. So this is the main part of uh, Reverie. And it is a circle upon a circle inside a circle. So the whole thing revolves around circular forms. And we're very fortunate to have some drone footage that John's um, generously shared with us, which we'll overlay so you can just see some of those circular yeah. forms. So the pond is a circle. Yes. The hedge, which we featured in a previous uh, video. The tapestry hedge. The tapestry hedge is basically a semicircle. Yeah. So the whole garden revolves around circular forms. And so it becomes a seriously circular garden and it adds to the sculptural element. So I guess we've, we've alluded to this before. It's either go hard or go home. But with this hard landscaping, again, you've got to really commit, haven't you? To oh, yeah. 
I guess the overall feel that you want and, and the layers and the levels that you want to create. Exactly, because if you don't do that, then you'll just end up with a hodgepodge of things going on. Yeah. So you need to have this sense of symmetry or order or something or that whatever is, it is that yeah, you whatever. Want to yeah, if it's non-symmetry and non-order, mm. you still have to go with it whole hog. So uh, this has been done superbly because you've got circular sculptural elements here as well as the circular lawn, circular pond, and the hedges. Yes, it is just beautiful. Well, let's go and look at some more interesting circular elements. Right, let's do that. Stephen, I'm joining you on the lily pad of <laughs> rock in the circular pond. And isn't it fantastic because oh. it's sort of an oval shape, but everything around is in sort of circles and, and what have you. And it's a wonderful mixed planting of all sorts of water plants, including water lilies, yes. water milfoils. There looks to be some water irises in here that and aren't in flower. this thing over here? Ah, that is water hawthorn, which is botanically known as a ponogeton. Ah. Uh, and that actually has edible flowers. So you can actually eat the flowers of that. So there you go. We might try. Yeah, an edible water garden. Uh, so this is a lovely body of water. Mm. Uh, as John would accept himself though, it's not quite deep enough. Well, let's hang 10 because we do have a whole pond series of water features, so we will link to that. What is the problem with this? All right. The pond is comparatively shallow, so it warms up quite a bit in the summer. Yes. The fish can't get away from fish-eating birds quite as easily as they could if the water was deeper. Yes. And, of course, you get far more evaporation if the water's quite shallow. So ah. they're all things that you have to deal with if you've got a very shallow pond. Yes. And this one would only be probably about 35, 40 centimetres deep or, you know, foot and a half or thereabouts. Yeah, yeah. So not, and you can quite easily yeah. see the bottom. I must say, though, the tinkling of water on a really sunny day yeah. is It is lovely. Isn't it? Oh, the other thing I did didn't mention too is that water lilies will do far better if the water's a bit deeper. They need about a meter of water to really perform well. Right. So there you go. So they're the main issues you've got with a pond like this. Excellent. Okay Stephen, are you brave enough to try on live camera? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly am. It's a plant I haven't eaten for many years, but here goes. If you don't make it, I'll tell <laughs> everyone. Crisp, crunchy, slightly nutty uh -huh. and delicious. Well, a huge thank you to John and Ned, the giant mm. wolfhound. Yes, that's right, exactly. I didn't know that you could house train a horse. No, no, it was, <laughs> I think it's a donkey, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, a million thanks to John for letting us wander through his incredible garden. I hope you have enjoyed it. If so, do hit subscribe to watch our continuing adventures. And we will see you next week with yet more adventures. We will. So until then, see you later. All right, bye all.